Hey, good morning, folks, and uh, welcome to our COIL conversation today. It's, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the last one we, we offered. It might have been in, in the summertime, I'm thinking, so uh, it's good to be back here in the fall. It's uh, really my pleasure today to introduce a, a colleague I've known for uh, at least eight years now, uh, and a good friend of mine, Brian Mulligan, from the Institute of Technology Sligo in Ireland. Uh, Brian is a program manager with the Center for Online Learning, and he is responsible for helping to manage, shepherd, stimulate, instigate uh, online distance learning in, uh, in Sligo in particular, but is very well connected, I can tell you, throughout the European distance education system and network, and he's very well respected. I had the pleasure of uh, visiting Brian a number of years ago for, for a conference in uh, Dublin, and uh, was very impressed by the uh, the respect and attention that Brian got, and is recognized as a leader. I was, I was. It was it was very cool. I was like, hey, I know that guy. So um, so Brian's uh, on a a little bit of a uh, fact finding and fact sharing tour of the U.S. Uh, he's heading back tomorrow's, but has been at a couple different institutions and offered to come up to Penn State and talk with us on on a topic that he's been working around of uh, doing low-cost MOOCs, that they don't have to cost so much. And over breakfast, uh, we were discussing some of the uh, other benefits of getting engaged in, in MOOC work. And so I'm hoping to explore a little bit of that today with you as well. But Brian, my pleasure to welcome you to Penn State again. Nice to see you, my friend. Well, thanks very much, Larry. Thanks for having me here. As, as he said, um, I was traveling to the US, and I'm working uh, sort of side work on this small European project on low-cost development of MOOCs. And I very much wanted to tell people about it and to get their views on it, because it hasn't worked out necessarily as, as like a lot of projects, necessarily as you'd expect. So being a bit of an old-fashioned teacher myself, I thought, I'll run through some slides and we'll see what happens. So if you don't mind. And, and uh, before you jump into that, Brian, just by way of format, Brian has uh, offered, we discussed a little bit, does he want to do his presentation and then we stop, or uh, would he like to uh, have some interaction and dialogue throughout? And, and we both agreed it would be uh, fun and uh, interactive uh, if, as he's presenting, you have a question that might come up, or a comment, or a reflection, uh, please feel free to share it both in the room of course, and, and uh, we welcome our guests online as well and invite interactions as well. That makes it a bit more of a conversation. And since it's called COIL Conversations, yep. hey, it all works. So, Brian, why don't you start us through your, your project's ideas there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, we have a, a small European project with team members from uh, very lovely places in Europe. And it's always worth getting a project just to travel to those places, <laughs> your own in Spain, Delft. Uh, Bath Spa in the UK and uh, Sligo in Ireland, they loved coming there too, I mm -hmm. have to say. And Bielefeld in Germany, which despite the protestations of our colleague Jorn there, is actually quite a pleasant place to visit. And for those any German viewers here, it does actually exist. It's a, a story that they, it doesn't exist. Okay, so the, the MOOCs idea struck me as very interesting when it emerged, uh, even though a lot of us were in online learning for long. Time, mm -hmm. It was really, a, we were a little bit taken aback by how much attention it got. And uh, But having said that, there was a certain amount of people who said, oh, hang on a minute, are these things financially mm -hmm. sustainable? Uh, there was a survey of universities in the UK, and they're talking, and this, is, this mirrored what we were hearing from the US as well. We're talking about $50,000 to build an online course. Now, I had been involved in, in developing online distance learning courses and I knew that I, I felt it didn't have to cost that much to develop an online course and if it was really going to cost that much this was going to cut out a lot of people particularly the small target audience and specialized topics you know things like you would be teaching in fourth year of a degree program uh, minority languages how are they going to come up with the money for this uh, technology that's constantly changing and even local uh, needs that wouldn't be reflected in a generic course that would be delivered worldwide. So we felt they didn't have to cost too much. So just to get an idea to 
get us thinking. I have sort of a few questions mm. to pose. Why do universities spend so much on MOOCs? Is it the quality of learning? Is it the reputation? I often say because I come from a small institution that the problem with big institutions is they have a reputation to lose. Mm. We can do a lot of things in mm. small institutions. We can take risks that big institutions mm. can't take. So maybe low cost MOOCs and low cost online learning suits a small institution like ours. So, so large can I play off of that? If, if large institutions have a reputation to lose, perhaps MOOCs give small institutions a way to gain. I would say indeed. The visibility. I would and say all. indeed, and that could be mm. an added motivation. The large institutions mm. do develop these high production value MOOCs, mm. and a large part of the motivation is drawing attention to their institution. Mm. Small institutions can do this as well. Mm. And, uh, Interesting. Now, it does mean that if you, if your motivation is um, essentially marketing, then you do have to worry about mm. uh, production values. But, mm. and we may talk about this later, uh, just before I get to that, I would say, are the pedagogy of these MOOCs, uh, and I'm probably talking to an audience of people who have been involved in online learning for a while, and general reaction was that, oh, this pedagogy is pretty simple. Mm. It's not sophisticated mm -hmm. in MOOCs. But, were mm. people learning? Mm. Generally, they were. If you wanted to learn, you could learn from a MOOC. No, if motivation wasn't the issue, you could learn. So I'd say pedagogy was a minor issue. Uh, the other thing is, if you give a course on campus, you know, if you're pretty happy with the course you give on campus, would you not consider just putting it online? Mm -hmm. And a lot of faculty nowadays, their course is almost half online anyway, mm -hmm. you know, the progressive faculty. So would, would you let 3,000 students into mm -hmm. your course? I always go back to mm. Salman Khan. I know some people have reservations, but mm. I have to say he's a bit of a hero of mine. Mm. Uh, and I'd say he's almost an accidental hero. Mm. You know. So just for those, just yeah. uh, language-wise, you're talking about uh, the, the Khan Academy. The Khan Academy. Yeah. And uh, this was done by a, a young man who originally was trying to teach his cousins mm. mathematical formulas yeah. and decided to do it yeah. via relatively low cost, low yeah. quality. Uh, production, but this Khan Academy has grown into a, a very large system. Yeah. Um, has the quality in that process, uh, and I haven't any, haven't examined these uh, for quite a while, has the uh, Khan Academy kept up or modified their standards of quality? I think they have, and almost, I would say, I mean, the point I would make here is the Khan Academy has proved Mm -hmm. that you don't need high production values mm -hmm. to get learning happening mm -hmm. in a big way. Yeah. That production values are not the key mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. Now, the Khan Academy does seem, now that it, they've got a lot of money, mm -hmm. they seem to be saying, uh, maybe we should invest in some higher quality materials. Mm -hmm. Now, I think most of their investment is mostly in the infrastructure behind it to drive it, particularly to make it more adaptive to the learning needs of the students. But still behind that, the production quality of a lot of their materials would be, you could say, adequate. And in, in from your case, you're taking a lesson learned yes, from that model. Exactly. And you're saying, how does that apply to? Exactly. Low exactly. cost production. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever the Khan Academy has done since then, the original content was simple. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a naturally good teacher. I mean, he wasn't a trained teacher, mm -hmm. but he was naturally mm -hmm. one. So it just shows you what you can. So to me, it proves the production values are not, mm -hmm. high production values are not required. Mm -hmm. Might be nice to have them, mm -hmm. but they're not required. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's this question there. So Khan Academy started really when the Khan Academy started, there was no alternative. True. So there was no high production. Alternative. Yes. But at this point where there is, mm -hmm. and folks have a choice to go to a high production, a low production, what would be the motivation? Assuming they have equality in terms yeah. of educational value and content. Yeah. Mm. So and I, I would... Competition yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And really, when it comes to open learning, 
competition may be good in a Darwinian sense, and so far as the best will come through, and we should all be happy when the best will come through. But if you look at maybe some of the things I've suggested at the start is that what about all those specialist niche, niche topics? I mean, this is mm. high school mathematics, uh, lower college mathematics, uh, a lot of his materials were, and other subjects as well, other topics. Um, but if, you're, if you have a specialist topic at third year, fourth year degree level, you should be confident that if, if there's no material out there, if there are no open materials out there, you get in and build it. It doesn't have to be really high quality. People are looking for this out there. People want it. So, and the other, uh, the other thing I would say is, if you've got the investment, if you've got the financial, you know, resources, and you know there are a lot of people out there whose eyeballs you already have, and who could benefit from it, then perhaps it is worth investing in high quality materials. But if you don't have that, and you know there's a need and nobody else is satisfying that need, the original Khan Academy should be proof to you that you can get out there and do something rather plain, and it will still be of value to many people. Good, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is really, I mean, MOOCs were going on, or open, free online courses were going on before MOOCs, and uh, I, I know this guy, Mike Fierik of Allison, because he's based in Ireland and he's been doing it for a while. His particular twist, a lot of people find uh, they have issues with because it's free online learning that's funded by uh, advertisements that may be around the learning, even though you can get a subscription model. But the only reason I included this show that uh, it's been there and that he would maintain that this is an important issue for world education. I mean, there's a whole, Larry, there's a whole other discussion on how irrelevant is free online learning to the developed world. Mm. In the USA, a lot of people can afford their send their mm. kids to college. They know that it will be easier to get a job if they go to college and they're seen to have a degree from Penn State or mm. whatever. In Europe, education is so highly subsidized that if you offer somebody free online learning, they'll say, well, I can get it almost free. Yeah. In yeah. this college, sure, but in the developing world, it's, it's a whole. They other don't have access to those kind of opportunities, yes. uh, either subsidized mm -hmm. or or the, their own resources. So MOOCs began to address that yeah. population with opportunities yeah. they never had before. And perhaps uh, a lot of people have remarked that mobile phones have had more impact in the developing world, where they didn't have a fixed yeah. line infrastructure. Yeah. That and perhaps it may be that it's in the developing world where the real radical changes will come in education mm. because really it hasn't, mass education hasn't, mass higher education hasn't developed out there. You know, I, I, and I don't mean to digress too no. much, but th this raises a question though for, for an institution like Penn State. So um, our, our interest in MOOCs over the last number of years has been primarily around some of the topics we've raised at Brand. Um, experimentation and what we can learn from those, which I would say was a big driver. Uh, we are a research institution. My colleague uh, Kyle Peck used to remind us a lot of this around the early days. Hey, we are a research institution. We need to be experimenting with MOOCs and learning from that. But one of the topics that wasn't so much on the table was the idea that Penn State should be helping developing countries. Like that wasn't a matchup of need and so forth. If it were, if it were an expressed outcome of, of these kind of projects, maybe we would have done more MOOCs. We've, we've done a fairly limited number. And I, I'm wondering, how does Sligo, when you look at the potential to serve a developing environment, mm -hmm. is, is that part of the mission? Is that, how do you balance that? No, and I think possibly I personally would see it very much along Kyle Peck's view, which is that nobody knows how this is going to turn out. Mm. We, it would be advisable that we try lots of different models. Mm. The, the, the unbundling, the disaggregated model is a very interesting model, this idea that you, should, you could give the learning for free. It 
the marginal costs are very little for an institution mm -hmm. to let its learning go for free mm -hmm. and then to charge for where there really are costs maybe in assessment and right. see what happens mm -hmm. um, because I mean I do believe that as we're a public institution in Sligo that we do have a duty certainly to the Irish taxpayer mm. uh, if the Irish taxpayer is currently not very interested in free learning they may be in the future I mean we're mm. it's well known the financial difficulties sure. have been in the country and we have to find cheaper ways of doing things mm. and better ways of doing things and it's mm. it's if we if there's more interest from the developing world in this, mm -hmm. then I think it's even of selfish interest mm -hmm. to the institution to try that, mm -hmm. to see what happens, because we may need this at home later. Yeah. Good point. Yep. <laughs> so one of the things that I've been thinking about is that in some ways MOOCs have been very focused, at, maybe that's just my lens, on higher education institutions, mm -hmm. post-secondary education, <clears throat> a little bit of K through 12, but primarily higher education. Um, so I have taken a MOOC and I got through it. I didn't land up going to that university, but I did want to experience mm -hmm. it. The, the things that have been sort of running around in my mind is I, I look at MOOCs and think these are, this is a great platform for students that want to learn things that may be important for them to learn, but outside of the academia. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, um, we have 40,000 students down the street, mm. and most of them are not prepared to be fiscally responsible adults. Mm. So while they may take a finance class online, mm. the potential forum to do uh, to not compete with the academia is to have them take an online MOOC mm. in, in fiscal responsibility or how to fiscal leadership or things mm. like that. Mm. So have you had any experience in sort of looking at MOOCs from a non-academic perspective? But life um, skills, maybe. Life skills. Yes. So yeah. Susie Orman offered a MOOC. Other people yeah. offer mm -hmm. MOOCs. So the MOOCs that would be of interest to many people would not necessarily compete with the academy, but supplement the academy. Yes. As it happens, we have done one small experiment in that, which was to add a course uh, in um, employability, mm -hmm. preparing for unemployed people, or, you know, for, um, these are actually for part-time online students that were currently out of work. Um, and it did have a certain uptake, uh, but we did find, and it's something that we would probably have half expected, was that if it's not on the examination, mm. I don't have the time to do this. Mm. So uptake was disappointing mm -hmm. and I have to say that it's my perception of young campus undergraduate students that they see studies purely in terms of their grades mm -hmm. and are very reluctant to take very useful courses um, but by the same token mm -hmm. those young students are great at finding the information they need so, as I say, if they want to find out that they have a, an immediate problem in college ahead of them, they will go to YouTube and search for mm -hmm. a video explaining, you know, how to solve that problem. There are online resources that people can pay for, for example, on the financial planning arena. Yeah. You know, my son in law and daughter, when they got married, took this course and how much they paid for it, you know, but mm. probably I could have told them the same thing in about 25 minutes, you know. Yeah, but, and you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they could have found a free one if they'd right, worked out. Right. And, so, I mean, times are changing very quickly. Right. Mm. If not then, probably yeah. now. Yeah. But I have to say that they, I don't see undergraduates really flocking to these um, mm. in a way at the back of my mind, the really big value is in probably education for those people who can't afford education. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be this uh, unbundled, disaggregated model where you take the courses and pay. I mean, after a lot of the criticism came, I would say that 
the and remember, I, the, some of the original criticisms came where that oh, those big universities they'll give MOOCs but they won't give credits. Right, right. Well, Georgia Tech's masters in computer science, which wasn't strictly MOOC but it was using MOOC techniques, showed that well we can use this model yeah. and give. And uh, the micromasters that are emerging now, say from MIT, which mm -hmm. is, I have to say, is the most innovative mm -hmm. institution, mm -hmm. you know, at, at scale, and, sure. uh, really are showing that this could have an impact on costs mm -hmm. very soon. Right, actually, I'm looking at a slide here from uh, Illinois, but they have now a MOOC-based MBA. Yeah. And they have, um, for that program, they have a, 2.3 million enrolled in the MOOC, 23,000 certificate seekers, and 500 degree seekers. I haven't seen that, and I'm glad you brought it mm -hmm. up because, mm -hmm. and it's like a lot of these things, you don't know which way it's going to go, and then when finally it settles in a particular direction, it moves very fast in that direction, and those numbers are big. You know, though, it, as you're talking through this, Brian, and we don't want to stop you from... And I'm sure that's, by the way, that's a high production value MOOC. That's not what I came to talk about. I would, bet, I would bet it is. But I, I think what you're, you're uh, laying out, and it's been something I know that um, a lot of folks here at Penn State have been exploring, is uh, what has the impact been of MOOCs on, on pedagogy and on the higher education system uh, on potential access? To, to advance learning on potential reduction of costs, it seems to me from what you're saying we haven't we haven't quite sorted no, that out. Just I, yet. I don't believe, yeah. and and I, I probably would comment, and it might be a little bit disappointing to maybe people who have who have <laughs> high standards in pedagogy is that MOOCs to some extent have shown that. Simple pedagogy can go a long way if mm -hmm. done well, uh, and also that maybe pedagogy isn't the the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. That there are other big issues. Cost is a huge issue. So mm -hmm. plain teaching out there to the masses is an important thing mm -hmm. to think about. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the earlier question about okay, well if you have if a lot of people are going to look at it, why not spend some money on it? I think that's very valid. Yeah. But as I say, in the meantime, and this project really, we're, this is just one tiny corner of the mm -hmm. MOOC agenda we're mm -hmm. looking at. It's the idea that if you teach or train people, consider building a MOOC. Yeah. That's yeah. really so. Good. Um, I, I would be reluctant to draw too many overall mm -hmm. lessons about MOOCs from this project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this project, as I say, I presented on this at an eMOOCs conference in Switzerland about two and a half years ago, and sure enough, or about the concept of low-cost MOOC development, mm -hmm. there was a few like-minded people in the audience mm -hmm. who came up to me, and that's where we formed this project oh, and got funding, uh, and it was in early 2015 mm -hmm. we started, and now we have our own MOOC, of course. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, we're just starting our thirteen our third delivery. Eighteenth, uh, what date is today? <laughs> I should. Uh, I was supposed to be here today. October eighteenth. Yeah, it's there starting you go. today. Terrific. Uh, <coughs> at, uh, uh, Four p.m. Brussels time, which is probably around now. Right about so, now, right? right. So um, there go. You can go on to that MOOCs for all of you and mm. uh, terrific uh, and sign up for. But I'm sure a lot of you uh, who are watching this are possibly professionals in the area and. Uh, but do send it to others. Yeah, it might be very good. Good. And do come in as a as a as a you know an interested bystander mm -hmm. and contribute to the discussion. Sure. Um, now, what I did want to say is how easy. I, I just want to show you the sort of things that might be in our project, or sort of argue why it could be cheap. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to say is, imagine you're in the position of a standard college lecture and you're giving a course, it might be 12 weeks with two lectures in the week, mm -hmm. you might give handouts, you would give support to the students, but they'll also support each other. You might give them a few assignments during it and give them feedback and they might be finding examinations. So that's not unlike the thousands and thousands of uh, college-based courses. And we know those involved in technology in colleges, I know that we're encouraging 
staff to get to use more and more technology in their teaching. And to some extent, for a lot of us, the holy grail is the flipped classroom. Mm -hmm. So how do we get a, a faculty, a lecturer, or a professor to flip their classroom? And so we might say to them, hey, we've got some really good technology for making it easy to you make recordings, say lecture capture mm -hmm. technology that you can use from your office and instead of giving a, an hour long talk, just divide it up into mm -hmm. four short little recordings. Um, uh, we know those of us that have been teaching for a long time know we'll do the recordings, we'll tell them to watch it and they won't watch it. They'll mm -hmm. come to class and they mm -hmm. won't watch it. So what we'll say is put up some quizzes there, mm -hmm. pretty quick and dirty quizzes that they have to take that show that they know the buzzwords mm -hmm. and watch the lecture. They have to take those before class. Um, rather than handouts, we'd be using the learning management system or a web page even, and we'd have open resources instead of giving them paper mm. handouts. So it's not that difficult to move. And when we bring them to class, maybe that's where we'll do homework or assignments. Mm. So we sort of say, um, we're, trying, we're in the business of already trying to persuade faculty members that it's not that difficult mm. to uh, blend your classroom or even to, mm -hmm. to flip it. Mm -hmm. So if we do convince somebody to flip mm -hmm. it, how much more is it to open that mm -hmm. to the world? Mm -hmm. And that's in a way, this is just an example of how you might build an open course. What else do you have to do? I've got very little here. In fact, we're taking away here. We're saying you can't support them, mm -hmm. but they can support each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are forums there for them to support each other. You can't grade their assignments, but they can grade each other, which we know from mm -hmm. research and some of us from practice is mm -hmm. quite an effective learning tool mm -hmm. and quite an accurate assessment tool. That we're not going to examine them, although a lot of colleges are saying, well, we will give you an examination, mm -hmm. but we'll have to charge you for mm -hmm. it. So that sort of just illustrates that there's not a lot to flipping it. Online, Carol is asking, uh, what does the MOOC model mean for text publishers? Um, yeah. <coughs> I, I mean, I think there's several reasons why text publishers are in a certain amount of trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. The open textbook movement uh, has them in trouble. The MOOC movement, the uh, OER has them. And you can see with companies likes of Pearson that they understand that they <coughs> excuse me is a potential threat a serious a potential threat if not an actual threat and they're <coughs> broadening their business models mm -hmm. so I would say it means they have to look at other things <coughs> other than just text and mm -hmm. indeed they are so that's mm -hmm. what I would say and I'd say MOOC is one of the many pressures we'll say on publishers to change their business model. Kyle makes a point uh, online uh, mm -hmm. to that question. He says, uh, many MOOCs try to keep costs down uh, or make the program free, so they try to avoid using texts, which uh, also um, challenges the text publishers because yeah. the business they're in. Yeah, they're, they're, they're trying to sell it. But I think your point is a good one there, uh, perhaps revisiting their value point yeah. in the marketplace and, and thinking, well, where and how do they contribute, and maybe there are different places for, for revenue, but it's shaking that industry up for sure. I know that if we go for a large-scale unbundled model where you pay for examination, the publishers, like Pearson, have these assessment centers all over the world, and uh, that will probably be a business that increases mm -hmm. massively mm -hmm. in the future. So mm -hmm. um, if you're a shareholder, uh, I'd say... Just make sure you're the, the publisher that you're a shareholder in has their eye on the new business models. I think there's plenty for them to do in this education and in the in the new education, as it were. And remember, what we're trying to do here is maybe we're expanding the market as well. More people are going to come into education. Mm -hmm. It'll be maybe done differently. Well, if I could just add in here, Kyle just made a comment there that exactly to that point. He said, <coughs> you know, if you um, if you recommend a test rather than require it, and even if a small fraction, but of a larger population, yeah. participate, that is going to generate sales. So it's, it's kind of turning the business model upside down, the scaling issue, 
the, the OER issue, uh, all of these things are forcing us to rethink some of our operating assumptions. And, and I think that's one of the things that MOOCs have, has done for us, is to get in there and kind of shake up our, some of our assumptions. Yeah, um, and to be honest with you, this is part of a, a much broader discussion of how, I suppose, MOOCs are going to change, mm -hmm. could change higher education. Um, I suppose one of the things that has become apparent to me over the years is that uh, even if higher education should change, uh, it's not going to change quickly because mm -hmm. uh, it's not known it, for that. It, yeah, but it has, it has, there's amazing confidence. The public have amazing confidence in public higher education. And it's going to take a lot to convince them, actually, that other models of education could be as good. Mm -hmm. And possibly it may take a lot to make sure that these other models of mm -hmm. education are, are trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And trust is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. But as we say, there are so many other discussions yeah, for another yeah, day. Yeah. <laughs> um, just to go on, uh, um, this is interesting, is that a lot of people try to do fancy animations when you're going for high production value. So these are the sort of tips and tricks that would be we would be giving people. You know, So often a quick sketch of an idea can be just as value as some mm. fancy animation. Uh, I suppose you could argue, again, that if you've got a huge amount of people viewing, then it's worthwhile spending the money on a particularly effective but expensive learning mm -hmm. demonstration. Mm -hmm. But if your faculty says, I want to build a MOOC, I don't have the resources, the audience will be relatively modest, then just um, understand that you can't have everything. Mm -hmm. But you can achieve a lot. I all, often express this as a sort of an 80-20 rule, a version of the 80-20 rule. Mm -hmm. and you get 80% of the impact with 20% of the effort. And getting that last 20% of the impact will cost you a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. So be happy with mm -hmm. your 80%. Well, and to your point, I'm, I'm looking at the gear demonstration you have up on the screen. Um, you know, could that image, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to presume that's a, what we'd refer to as a low-cost version yep. of a gear demonstration, right? But can that still convey in a phys physics class or an engineering class, could that still convey the concept that the faculty member is trying to get? Or um, might the faculty member do some research and find that there is an animation oh, yes. of yes. gears that yes. complements this or perhaps replaces it? And so for no cost or virtually no cost, you can, you can build a really effective lesson. I had this exact discussion with a faculty member in University of Virginia yesterday mm. morning. Uh, and he was a physics mm. professor, and uh, he said, uh, oh, no, I spent a lot of time on this. I got uh, to show uh, that all bodies accelerate at the same time. I dropped a GoPro out a window with a ball mm -hmm. to make a video to show that the ball was constantly in the view of the camera. And he spent a lot of time on mm -hmm. that 10 second video. He says, and, um, I, and I sort of said to him, but when I was in college, a lecturer would have drawn that in chalk on the board and I would have <laughs> got it in five minutes. And, and, uh, and well, he says, but if there's a lot of people going to watch it, right. why not? Go the extra mile. And I would offer, I bet you if you did a YouTube search on that. Yeah, and, and that was my, that was going to be my thing. And, it might already And to exist. some extent, maybe he did this two years ago. Sure. And sure. Uh, there wasn't. But, yeah. and I have to say, it's, it's one of the wonderful things I like about YouTube and education is that more and more people are saying, I suppose in a way they're saying, well, I'm not going to make any money out of this, so yeah. I don't mind sharing it. That was always my attitude to my... Mm -hmm learning materials way back in the 90s, mm -hmm. as soon as I discovered the web. I, I thought, I've got some good stuff on computer programming here. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'll ever make money of this. I, I'm too busy doing other things anyway. Mm -hmm. So I would just publish it for free mm -hmm. on the web. And there's so many people doing this mm -hmm. that uh, that's probably the best way to do it. And we would say, that I have a point there, reuse open education resources. Mm -hmm. you know, these are all the tips for... Bef before you move on, though, what what... Does this change the responsibility of the faculty member in terms of the quality and the accuracy? So one thing I wouldn't want to do, let's say someone drew this chart and got yeah. the arrows wrong, right? yeah. or went to a YouTube clip 
where uh, oh, there was a faculty member here years ago in meteorology who had a website up called Bad Science. Yeah. And in his uh, this website, he used to debunk things that we think happen a certain way and describe it, and it makes sense. It's just inaccurate. What what role does it change for the faculty <laughs> member to be able to make sure that what is going out there, the resources are are scientifically or otherwise accurate? I'm going to be very unpolitically correct and say here, well, I did show an example from physics, not sociology. <laughs> 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 but I would say, I suppose one of the things I like about the internet is the fact that there's a certain agility there that mm -hmm. you can put things out there, and if you make a mistake, you can fix it. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and you really, this, you know, I mean, this idea of agile, software development where <clears throat> everything's in beta. Mm -hmm. You know, put your course out there in beta. Get some eyeballs on it. If there's something in there that's wrong, they'll find they'll it quicker than you out. will. Yes, that's right. Uh, let's hope yeah. it wasn't a critical piece on bridge design mm -hmm. and somebody's going to then go up and after watching your MOOC, they're going to design a bridge and get Without a Without that, that center pillar, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, unlikely. Mm -hmm. uh, and remember, mm -hmm. When I was in college, you know, you could get 60% in structural design and still go on to be a structural engineer. Yeah. I mm -hmm. wonder what was in that 40% oh, you didn't know. Yeah. That, so extra, it that was, extra period. Yeah. So it was always, <laughs> it, it's always an issue. But yeah. uh, to answer your question, I would say that I find uh, the whole idea of agile development, continuous improvement, is a concept that's applicable to free online courses mm -hmm. and that you should always Get it out there as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. except that there will be problems or issues with it, mm -hmm. and hope that those eyeballs will tell you and say, in fact, put up front in your course. Yeah. If there's some errors in this course, please bring it to my attention. Not to mention all, yeah. the, t all the time you could spend checking out for intellectual property rights, mm -hmm. where it might be as well to say, if I've inadvertently you know, breached any copyright, Please tell me, and I'll fix it sure. straight away. Okay. Um, so, yeah, well, thank you. Um, as I have to say, I love the technology around here, but uh, our advice generally is don't worry too much about technology. A good microphone is probably your most important piece of kit. Mm -hmm. I can see it around here. There's a lot of attention. I'm looking at my colleagues yeah, across the row here. <laughs> Would you agree, Brad and uh, yeah. Haley are our production, and you know we... What people hate is yeah. poor audio. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, there are tricks that you can do to record quickly so you don't have to edit. The best thing is to prepare well, present, don't edit. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there are a few tricks you can do to mm -hmm. make sure that it's easy to edit afterwards, like leaving clues. These are the types of things. Now, I've just... Two more slides here, mm -hmm. here Larry because our project possibly hasn't been as successful as we'd like. Mm -hmm. So we sort of feel we've proved, okay, you can build an open course, an online course cheaply. And we've done it as a MOOC, we've talked to people, we're getting great feedback. To some extent, you almost feel you're preaching to the converted. Mm -hmm. um, but the impact isn't as, just in terms of magnitude, it isn't as big as we would have expected. Mm. We're not getting floods of faculty from around the world mm. coming to say, hey, I want to build a MOOC, and mm. how can I do it? Show me mm. how to do it. Uh, Sign-ups are fairly low. Mm. People are very busy. Not enough people have time to even complete the course. And the people that have mounted, you know, we might have maybe up to 10 at this, of people who've, who've started construction on MOOCs, and, you know, one or two completed. Mm -hmm. So we're not having the world impact mm -hmm. we would have expected. So to some extent, this is the reason I'm visiting a few universities sure. where I'm over here. I want to get people telling me, why aren't people? Mm -hmm. do, it's cheap to do. Do you mind going back to, to that slide? Yeah. So I, I just, um, I, the first thought, I had two, two thoughts when, when, I, when I saw this. The first is, uh, at least here in the States, and this I don't believe is the case in other contexts, but you can tell me that the term MOOC has was we were so saturated. You know, yeah. five years ago, six four, yeah. you couldn't you couldn't 
go to the grocery market without hearing somebody say the move. Um, and after a while, I think people just had had, had enough of it. It began to, to take on its own negative baggage. Well, is this among people who are in the education system? I would have imagined that the public at large, the idea of a MOOC would be pretty just foreign. hugely exciting. Well, foreign for starters, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, oh my, you know, I'm going to get, I can get access to university courses for free, which I have to say, a lot of the courses didn't align with university courses, you right. know, that were sort of either introductory or maybe for continuous professional development. You know, the standard university undergraduate courses yeah. that would cover full three credit hours, there wasn't a lot of those around. Um, but I would have thought that the public would find them quite interesting when they heard about them, but faculty maybe have had too much of it, you know. I think faculty and administrators. Who, uh, who were put into position of examining the phenomena, and my colleagues online can, can help me out here. You know, once the wave crashed, so to speak, uh, we, you know, we rode the crest, the interest, and we learned a lot. Uh, let me just say that we learned a lot. Uh, uh, Kyle and, and, and lots of other folks were involved in examining, you know, what were the lessons, and, and it was a really good experience. Um, however, it was also determined this is not a direction, at least at Penn State, that we're going to continue on wholesale. So we're, yeah. we continue to do uh, a handful, I want to say less than a dozen, and, um, and, and those are done very well, and, and there's a continuation process there, but we're not adding new, new yeah. at this point. Part of the reason, I think, is the, is the terminology, and um, I, it reminds me a little bit of the phenomena around badging. You know, if you talk about badging here today, uh, sometimes you'll get this glazed look of people equating it back to scout badging or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you use the term alternative credentialing or micro-credentialing, all of a sudden they sort of perk up a little yeah, bit. And, oh, that's yeah. an interesting concept. What does that mean? And so one is that may be a, a, an idea of the, uh, of the language. The second, the second thought was this particular MOOC, the one you folks developed, is a fairly... It's very it's niche. It's a very niche oriented. I mean, on the uh, next lead sl slide, I oh, suppose okay. I have mentioned some of the things, and maybe I should just mm -hmm. throw them up so people can see. I mean, these are the things that we're suggesting. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's, I mean, if you can say number of academics worldwide, that's a limiting yeah. uh, number of academics who are interested, yes. um, number of academics who think they have could get the skills, mm -hmm. Um, you know, number of academics then who have the time yes. <laughs> you're yeah. starting yeah. to, you're dividing that down and down. So it's a very specialized audience. Yeah. Um, uh, but maybe there are other reasons as well. And I've mentioned there, well, okay, the cost is low, mm -hmm. but the time, uh, the skills required. Yeah. We would argue that the skills required don't have to be that high, mm -hmm. but it's a, it is quite a challenge to get that <coughs> message to the right people. Yeah, yeah. So it could really be a slow burner. Mm -hmm. uh, that maybe there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the hypothesis here, mm -hmm. but it's just going to take time for it to see yeah. through. <coughs> yeah, but I think uh, your point that Penn State starts in our MOOCs. Um, I think we really need to be aware of what's going on around us mm -hmm. at our peer institutions. So you mentioned the MicroMasters, and Michigan, <coughs> University of Michigan is big into those right now. Mm -hmm. And for example, in a recent article said they have 100 MOOCs that have drawn more than 5 million enrollments. Wow. And they're pushing those now to actually have linking those up to degrees. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, at Penn State, we need to be maybe rethink where we stand and it's interesting that you say that the MicroMasters and the Illinois MBA is really a bit of a game changer, really, because I suppose the original skepticism of MOOCs, probably based on two things. One is you don't get credit, and the other is they cost too much. They don't get credit, probably, was the key one. And some institutions have actively addressed that, and suddenly mm -hmm. 
enrollments get even more massive again. But yeah. more importantly, completion rates and those are our completion numbers, which is probably more important, mm -hmm. uh, are, are are going way up because you can get credit. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I think David, to your point, maybe it's about strategy, right? Maybe it's being thoughtful as an institution, thoughtful about where do MOOCs fit in the to overuse the term again, but ecosystem, you know, of the university. Can it be a, a leader into other kind of programs? Does it, can we use it in a way to offset the cost if I can give you value and, and count for your work in it? And, and I don't know, it seems like, if, this is my impression, but it seems like, okay, that was yesterday. Now, what's next? And, and we're not going back, maybe, as, as though we ought to from time to time, say, okay, well, what did we learn from that? Is there a way to take something there and build it into a program offered through the world campus where here's an alternative to get three credits? Um, I think the financials are probably speak a lot to that. You know, why would we give away uh, that, you know, that uh, potential tuition? And that becomes an inhibitor because the money is an enormous driver for us. Yeah, but... You know the phrase, if you don't eat your lunch, somebody else is going to eat your lunch, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If, say, one of your good online master's programs, if some other college decides we're going to use a MOOC model to deliver the same master's program, which is separating the assessment from the delivery of the mm -hmm. topics, how is that going to eat into your masters? Mm -hmm. You know, if you get those sort of numbers that mm -hmm. uh, Illinois is getting. What's going to happen to the other MBAs? Sure, Harvard's MBA will do fine, um, and Penn State mm -hmm. may actually be high enough in the hierarchy to survive. Mm -hmm. But this is just going to destroy the MBAs at the lower reach mm -hmm. institutions. And that was, is it Hennessy from Stanford a few years ago said, you know, it's, there's going to be a tsunami and it's going to be private and the lower grade institutions that are going to suffer. Yeah. We've seen what's happening to private now, maybe for some other reasons, you know, but uh, sure. so there are probably a lot of smaller institutions no doubt mm. have good quality learning, but they don't have the high profile and they may be, um, may be going to suffer. So Penn mm. State maybe has the luxury of taking a little time to consider yeah. this, yeah. Yeah. but maybe some other some small institutions like us sure. may have to act faster. Sure. Uh, Kyle Peck online says uh, one answer is to give away the course and charge, uh, but you charge less, and you charge for the high quality assessment and certification. Yeah. I, I've heard Kyle make this comment many times in meetings, is uh, one of the value points for the university is around the assessment yeah. of learning, right? It's not and necessarily the in the content production. And that's where it goes back to trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. This, uh, that universities have built up a brands that are based on trust, mm -hmm. and it's on Trust by employers and trust by parents mm -hmm. and prospective students that if you go in there, you will learn and this will give you a career. Yeah. And that trust can be used in the assessment process, sure. in the accreditation process. Because sure. it carries weight and, yeah. and has value. Brad? So Kyle's uh, response was actually in response to an earlier question where uh, Timothy Marshall was saying, the point about the negative stigma about MOOCs, is it perhaps that the fact that MOOCs are free is being equated with not having value in the marketplace? And is perhaps mm -hmm. a few of the solutions, and, and people have been going back and forth on solutions, is it a nominal fee for the MOOC would imply certain value to that mm -hmm. course? Would credit imply a value to that course and, and have people equate MOOCs with, with, uh, with quality and something that they'd want to do? Uh, or uh, CEUs or professional development credits for those who qualify? What's a solution to uh, allowing people to see a value in MOOCs? Well, I, I think to some extent, it. I, I think charging people to take the MOOC 
will undermine the principles of it. Also, to me, it undermines the principle of uh, of an idea which has great potential, the idea that you study as you see fit, and then when you're ready, you go for assessment. Uh, so maybe there would be a psychological trick there in charging for MOOCs to enhance their per, the perception of value. But I think that would underline it. But I think um, high standards in assessment and accreditation, maintaining high standards, will be enough to uh, create a reputation for the MOOC in the long term, and the, along with the institution that's awarding it. I don't think that the fact that MIT has a MicroMasters in supply chain management, I don't think it's going to damage MIT's reputation at all, the fact that it costs nothing mm. to take the three MOOCs that are in that MicroMasters. Uh, and I am sure that the assessment will be robust and to a high enough standard to maintain it as well. So my answer to that would be, I think it would be negative to charge for MOOCs, and I don't think it's necessary to generate trust. I think over time, this model will gain trust, and it's the the assessment that will, and the institution that stands behind that will, will generate that trust. But Carol online makes a comment and says that um, you know a course might have value, so I'm, I'm going to presume she means they're a MOOC, might have value for certain groups, for individuals, professionals, yeah. in, in a, I don't know, engineering. So you can create really the alternative path that might not come from the standard um, uh, university offerings, but an alternative style of offerings, perhaps at a lower cost. Mm -hmm. And it may mean something because it comes from the institution to a certain group of people. But again, now we're, moved, we're going back to your experience of, of a really niche product and the challenges of getting enough people to warrant the investment. Yeah, I mean, our discussion is wandering into other topics other than low cost. It's trust in MOOCs, it's assessment, it's mm -hmm. value, these types of things. That's not necessarily what this project mm -hmm. is uh, is addressing. But, I mean, we would maintain that our low cost appro approach to MOOC development is very suitable for continuous professional development mm -hmm. in niche professions that uh, a new technology is, I mean, you get um, a, a particular profession and there's a lot of people who are mid-career, there's no particular pressure for them to learn new stuff, but there's a lot has happened in their profession, so um, mm. they could do with taking these courses. So having free courses online is, is very attractive to them. You could say, well, who's going to do this? Who's going to pay for it? Well, we're going to say, well, it doesn't cost much to do, and there may be other mm -hmm. motivations for doing it, you know, as well. Or there could be a course that's in a college and may as well let professionals at it. No, that, that's up to the individuals that are going to produce it to, to justify why they're going to do it. But what we're saying is costs shouldn't be an issue yeah. in doing it. You know, Brian, uh, earlier in the introduction, you, you said that uh, you were on here on a bit of a fact-finding yeah. tour yourself to try to dig into. And I was just wondering if you can share with us what have you been discovering as you've been talking to different individuals at different institutions? Any answers come to mind of your question? Well, it's it's been universities I've been visiting and probably the thing is time mm -hmm. and incentivization that most faculty are incentivized to do research, publish papers, mm -hmm. and there is no real reward for getting involved in making your knowledge available freely to the public. In larger institutions, there would be a concern, a little bit of a concern about mavericks going out there and doing really cheap and cheerful courses that might reflect badly on the institution, mm -hmm. so it's unlikely to be support for them doing it cheaply, mm -hmm. as it were. Because uh, the reflection back on the it's a quality statement back on the yeah. institution. There is as well the idea that the uh, that, that professors will see it as a reflection of themselves and wouldn't want to put out anything that mm. didn't, oh, uh, that wasn't 
that was short of TV production. Sure, you know. sure. uh, some of these MOOCs out there, they're, they're like mini TV series, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of production value. That's mm -hmm. what they'd like to see. They look at one and say, yeah, I'd like to do that, mm -hmm. but I can't do that. Right. Well, and if it can't be that, I don't want to do it. Great. Well, listen, I'm watching our time here, and uh, I want to see if there's any other comments or, or questions from our group online or in the room, of course. Um, David? Brian, if you had experience with Lightboard, you know, where you stand in front of a piece of glass and you want a piece of glass and actually face the audience while you're lecturing? No, I haven't. And uh, I won't say I deliberately shied away from it, but my immediate assumption was that that might be a little bit pricey to do. Um, we've kitted up what we call a mini studio, a self-service studio, but really we're taking, we've just put in a good graphics screen and a second screen so you can talk to the screen and if you want to write on your slides or want to do some mathematics, you just write and just start record. You know, we've taken a very simple approach to it. Um, if you use one of those glass screens, you have to flip the video later, so it increases the amount of post-production. And I suppose, to some extent, I'm taking the principle of what's the absolute simplest way we can do it. The, the 2080 rule, maybe, we could call it. I was just looking at a video before um, online on YouTube about a guy who did it really cheap. He had a picture of plexiglass, you know, just took the picture out took the mirror out of his bathroom, so we shot into the mirror and reflected back, yeah. so just flip it, you know. And uh, so one, of the, one of the, my colleagues, uh, Jorn uh, Lewisach in from Bielefeld, I would describe him as the Salman Khan of Germany. Mm -hmm. He has, you know, thousands of math videos in German up online and millions of views, mm -hmm. and he does some tricks like that for a teleprompter where he has a, a screen and a glass and the camera the other side of the glass, 45 degree glass, and shows you how to do it in a DIY at home. It's very interesting. But um, it, it's interesting that we're a bunch of people that are mm. all convinced on the low cost approach, mm. but even we disagree. Like he'd say to me, well, I didn't mean that low cost. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I still have my standards, yeah. right? <laughs> so we're differing standards where that uh, production value is. But um, uh, certainly he's got some great skills and recommends things like that. And I wouldn't mind uh, seeing a little homemade version of that that I might be able to implement. Well, listen, uh, our, our time is up. Brian, I, uh, oh, any other questions? I'm sorry? I'm sorry for being late. That's okay. Nice yeah, to see you. My calendar totally wrong. Oh, so sorry. I thought I was early. Um, but anyway, um, I was wondering, I don't know if you spoke to this, but are there aspects of MOOCs that are more effective than others? I've taken several MOOCs, and I'm wondering, you know, the discussion forum doesn't seem like anything that would cost a lot of money, but how effective? Have you done any studies like that? No, I haven't. And in a way, I mean, I to some extent, I worry a little bit about a certain approach to MOOCs in higher education. Uh, a lot of people have said, one of the great things about MOOCs is you've got big numbers and you can do research, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so it's feeding our research agenda. Uh, and actually, I read some of the research that come out and I've taken tips, mm -hmm. like the optimum mm -hmm. length of a, a video seems to be coming out in about six or seven minutes. Very useful. Mm -hmm. Just use it. Um, uh, but I would say... Mm. There's a lot to be said for just try it and see what works and change mm. it, you know. Um, and to me, forums are a bit of a no-brainer, really, because we we can't you can't provide great faculty support or, uh, or support from the professor on the MOOC, so the forums are the way to go. Mm. But I can't say that I've I, I've spent much time looking at the research or, or doing any research. I certainly haven't the time to do any research on it and to say how it can be best used in that. Uh, and by the way, there does seem to be a conflict between MOOCs that have a specific start date and end date mm. and MOOCs that are constantly open, open all the yeah. time. And I'm not quite sure how to resolve that, mm. but... Hey, lots of options. I was going to say lots of options and lots of new things to discover. So. 
Um, let me thank our uh, our in uh, room audience here, and and of course our uh, our guests online as well. Thank you for your input and your discussion. I uh, appreciate uh, everybody's um, interest in this topic, and I think to some of the points we made earlier, we still have a lot to learn. And uh, this this is one method of uh, experimenting with efficiency and effectiveness online. So I appreciate you stimulating some conversation, Brian. And, Always a pleasure. And I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. Terrific. Thank this you. Message out there. Thank you. Good to have you.